Welcome to the art of, na art of narrative and storytelling in Minecraft maps. Thank you, for everyone, for coming. Woo. Uh, before we get started, actually, I'm going to show you a quick video uh, showing the history of storytelling in Minecraft. Uh, it's quite a good history with uh, interesting stuff, so I hope you uh, enjoy it. In the beginning, there was nothing. Then came a big bang of creation. Signs were introduced into Minecraft. They had limited text on them, and quickly the creators found themselves getting frustrated by their many limitations. Uh, hang on, let me, uh... Okay, so they turned to text files. These files were embedded into the map downloads and allowed much more flexible method of getting story communicated to the players. But it took players out of the experience, and in the end, it was decided that simpler is better, and text files were scrapped. Oh, what's this? Um, okay, let me, I'll click this. Full voiceovers using YouTube videos were also experimented with although they were inconvenient for players who had to tab out of the map, like with the text files, but then also stare at a boring YouTube video waiting for it to end. So map makers went back to signs. There were some neat tricks used like texture packs and dialogue that used complex redstone mechanisms and falling sand. This brought the static NPCs to life. I am the Grinch and you can bring me your toys. You know, the ones for little girls and boys. If you don't, I'll keep you cold here in the snow. You'll never be able to finish your video. Sad I am that you didn't listen to my voice. This video will indeed continue, regardless of your choice. Other experiments were used like this image to map technology. Writable books were also added. This allowed a lot of text to be communicated to the players, but they were really used for torn diaries and the like. It didn't make much sense to use them for character dialogue. That all changed with command blocks. Command blocks allow you to push dialogue through the chat window. Cool titles were introduced. And with a custom resource pack, full voice acting. Hi, CDF. Hello there. But not just that. You can now bring your characters to life. The technology for telling a good story in Minecraft is here. And it's ready for you right now. All you need to do is write one. Yay. Uh, so I'm Jiggerbov. Uh, I made that video there, and you'll see some of the maps that I've made. Uh, I've made City of Love, Erinev Mansion Adventure, The Juggler's Balls, uh, which is a family favorite, Simburbia, and Infinity Dungeons, which you can play on Realms. Uh, 20 maps published, over two bu book publications, and 10 million downloads. Uh, I've written a lot of stories and made a lot of people happy, happy and I'm very happy to be talking here today. All right, greetings. My, Ron Smalek here, been doing Minecraft maps since 2011 with these guys and Solo. Uh, I've put out some stories that we're going to talk about today. Grinchmas, for one, has a very unique storyline. One of my newest maps, Wendy, has an interesting twist in it. Uh, I have also spent a lot of time trying to draw things from the community through the 60-minute map contests, through my vanilla challenge contests, and trying to get stories out of you, the audience. So look forward to sharing what I know today with you. And hello, everyone. My name is C. Depp Deman, and I don't actually sound like that. Um, so I'm, I've made seven largely published maps at this point um, through the Exponential Experiences series that told a story throughout all of them. I do 60-minute map challenges. I'm on the Voxabox build team, which we build maps for many popular YouTubers that you've uh, seen do videos. I do tutorials on my channel about telling you how to make cool map experiences. And I make light shows, because light shows. Uh, I have a problem. I mean, how do you start? 
how do you start to tell people about storytelling in Minecraft? How do we, how do we tell people that we do this literally every day? We have talks like this literally every day, and we've been doing this for the last three years. Do you start? Do you tell them that Jiggerbob created a dinner? He created a dating sim three years ago in Minecraft that was beloved. Do you tell them that Ron has looked at over 2,000 maps? If there are seven clones at every person here in Minecon, that would still not be enough maps that he, he's looked at more people if there are seven of you everywhere. Do I say that CDF the man has an entire world created like Lord of the Rings in Minecraft that he's been carrying through his entire maps. I mean, how do you tell them? Or does it come down to me? And I can say, I don't like the way that, story, that many people are telling stories in Minecraft. And this is the panel that will, at the end of it, you will have the best opportunity and be in the best way to tell your stories in Minecraft. These are the people that you need to listen to to give you the best tools you need to tell your own stories. I think that's how we do that. Thanks, Mosh. He's our hype guy. Hype. Uh, so how do you make a good story in Minecraft? Uh, there are a lot of do's and don'ts, very famous uh, do's and don'ts. We're going to go through them one by one, and I'm sure we're all going to agree 100% on each of them and see if you agree too. Uh, there is no real right or wrong answers, but this is more about making sure that you know um, that anything you do, and especially with story, uh, it's, it's art. And we really try to, to bring that out. So our first one, do tell your story in three arcs. So in, in classical storytelling, if you look it up on Wikipedia or hundreds of articles, most of the time you'll find stories have three arcs. There's the initial exposition section where you're setting the motivation, the background for the character, the world that you're in. There's the rising action, which is usually where something interesting happens. And then there's the climax of the story. You guys may have heard these terms before, um, but when you're designing Minecraft maps, this is one of the first things that I think about is, OK, what are the major three portions of my story? And how am I going to get the player through all three of them and make it interesting? I think the climax is my favorite part. Uh, there's a lot of action, usually. Uh, there's big reveals. Uh, that, that's a good time. A lot closer. <laughs> so. You guys do the same three arcs? Uh, yeah, so I try to stick to that three arc. There are other storytelling structures out there. There's a very famous Joseph Campbell's um, A Hero's Journey, which has multiple steps, like a call to action for our hero. And then he goes on this big epic quest and then comes back. That's a more detailed storytelling uh, um, structure that you can follow. Um, but you definitely want to keep it simple. You want to tell one story in your map so that viewers and players can understand what's going on. And a three-act structure, much like the Greek tragedies and plays, will help you do that. And I will say, uh, City of Love doesn't have three acts. So I don't entirely agree with this first, very first slide. But I, I would say it does, because when you first meet the character, you learn about the diary, the apartment, what your quest is, right? And then all the different people you try to date throughout the city, that's your sort of middle act where you're trying to figure out who you fall in love with. Culminating in the final climax at or after the wedding scene. And the important part about this is that the three act structure allows you to do a full circle. You, you introduce the initial premise, you draw the player away from their objective, and then you bring it right back around so where they started is where they always wanted to be, quote unquote. Or they, they, they return to their hero's journey. Absolutely. Do aim for 20 minute story segments. Uh, most people here know a YouTuber and I, ask you, how, how long is a typical Minecraft YouTube video? Anyone? 20 minutes. <laughs> I think it's 20 minutes. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's 20 minutes. Uh, and incidentally, this is another one I sort of agree with. Uh, but definitely, definitely 20 minutes is a good length. 
of time. Anything longer, you start to disengage the player, uh, and 20 minutes is good. Yeah, one thing you'll know as a map maker is you cannot predict what the player is going to do or how long it's going to take. Mm. If you're playing a puzzle map, you might think it's a very easy puzzle. The player is going to look at that. It might take them an hour. It might take them five minutes. But when you're designing your story, just think about it in terms of how much information you think you can get across in about 20 minutes mm. and then have your yes. outline sort of geared towards that. There's no perfect timing of a map. But this is just one of the things that we've learned over five years to kind of help the pacing. I think so, oh. I made a map, and it was 10 minutes long. I gave it to Ron. <laughs> a great way to think about this is to look at what television is doing. Television has naturally merged into about 22-minute episodes with chances for breaks. Those breaks will generally happen three times, if you notice that follows the three-act structure. And now there's shows that do 11 minute runs that leave you, always leave you wanting more. Absolutely. Um, and with the 20 minute segment, it really helps cut back on your scope of your map. If you try to aim for that 20 minutes, it allows you to create a map and a story that is manageable, right? You don't want to do a eight hour epic long adventure for your first map or your second map because that's really hard. Um, 20 minutes, although, does not mean a short map. You can tell a lot of different story, uh, and you can tell across multiple settings and have the player go through those within a 20-minute segment. So the scale can change, um, but you definitely want to keep it manageable, because ultimately, you want the map to be released and played by millions of people. Prioritize gameplay. But I thought this was about story. So gameplay is really important, right? We are seeing a lot of games come out that you can walk through and not really do anything, right? But then that's a passive experience for the player if you really think about it. Um, gameplay, in essence, is having the player make choices within the environment that affect what's going on. And that's important. Absolutely. So wait, you, should you have a story in a map? Like, if gameplay is important and we're saying prioritize it, like in a parkour map, what good is a story in a parkour map? Well, I, I think obviously that'll help you understand what you're jumping towards or climbing towards is the overarching story and goal. So even though you may want to have uh, your parkour be sort of what your map is known for, giving the person a reason to be there is a pretty powerful tool. Well, I'll, tell, I'll say this. If someone tells a great story in a parkour map, that is going to stand out because there are hundreds of thousands of parkour maps in flat worlds that you're jumping between blocks. And personally, that's not interesting. But if you were telling me that you created a parkour experience where you're jumping through a city running from the cops or running from Godzilla, or you're climbing the mountain to reach the epic pillar up top, yes. the beam of light, that's yes. the sort of stuff that we want to see in maps. Give a reason for what the player is doing. Don't just jump between blocks. Absolutely. So it can definitely enhance it then. The, the gameplay is the core important part of it, and your story should cater to the gameplay. Yeah, I, I would say when you walk away from a map, do you remember the whole story, or do you remember that one moment where you had that interesting challenge that you had to get past? I remember the challenge I had to get past. Why, though? Why, is, why, would, why do I want that more than anything else? Well, that's what will stick with you. Yeah, absolutely. You build up to that one jump, and it's 19 minutes, and then the last minute is the most important thing, and you remember that so much more. Yeah. Do have a simple storyline. Uh, yes. The map uh, that you can see on the screen the goal of that one is to burn the wool. The story is that you are a character and you have to burn the wool. <laughs> uh, it's a simple one and everything is told to the player and the player is uh, made to experience it through their own actions. What do you think? Uh, I don't want you to confuse a simple story with the way that you tell the story. So you can do it through unique and complicated means. You can put in plot twists, use different yes. uh, storytelling devices. But your core story that you want the player to go through really 
if you want to get it all across in you know, one sitting or in a memorable amount of time, you want to keep it simple uh, and not have you know, 50 generations of things occur. The key here is that the player has to understand what's going on. Because if you don't understand what's going on, you've completely killed your story off, right? If the player's like, oh, why did this happen? Or why did this happen? Like, I don't know, I'm just moving forward. So it's very important that the story concept is simple enough and conveyed well enough that people can grasp it for the entire map. Right about what you know, uh, Ron. <laughs> so, I, don't, I don't know anything about I can speak this on one. this. Yeah. Uh, the ahead. important part uh, of writing what you know is that everyone knows what parkour is. Everyone understands that uh, you make an adventure map, you know, go find the diamond core. You want to bring something new to the table. You want to bring who you are and what you have experienced in your life to the game so you can share your story, your experience in that way. You try to do that instead of saying, I want to copy that game. Because then you introduce something new and something real that people will connect with. Oh, we're going to talk about inspiration pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other thing, too, is it makes it more personal. So if, I, if I'm reading a book, for example, uh, and I read about some place I've never been, I can tell by the language that the author uses that they know something about that setting. Maybe it's just a vocabulary word here and there that they slip in or the way they phrase the speech. You can do that same kind of thing in, in Minecraft. So in this example, Fear in a Handful of Dust, uh, when I made this map, it's set in a desert. I don't live in a desert. Uh, it, what? <laughs> I don't live in a Chicago's desert. Chicago's not a desert. So it, it doesn't have anything you know, from my life, per se, in it. <laughs> However, in the back of my mind, I wanted to kind of emulate some of the things in my favorite Stephen King books, mm. the Dark Tower series. And so by kind of understanding that series back and forth, I put in little Easter eggs or just little touches that I know to personalize the story. And that will come across as heart to your player as well. And you have tons of stories to tell. Don't think that you have nothing to talk about. You, what about the time you came home and you, know, you wanted some ice cream and there was no ice cream in the freezer? And then you talked to your parents about it and it was like, oh no, sorry, honey. And then, okay, well maybe your character in your map sneaks out and goes on this big epic quest to quench the thirst of ice cream, right? Like, you have stories in your everyday life, conflicts, that you can play on and that you understand. Hey, maybe there's that cute person over there that you would want to go talk to, but you're shy, and, but you know that they like which, something. Which one are you talking about? Uh, oh, I, I don't know. I, uh, I wasn't specific. <laughs> the people over there. Yeah, those people waving. Oh, okay, hey. okay. Hi. Hey. Um, <laughs> So yeah, you have stories to tell. Think about it. Really think about what kind of conflicts you have in your life. And conflict is going to be that main source of interesting stories that you can put into Minecraft. It's doable. Raise the stakes with conflict. Perfect timing. <laughs> so, so this is just put a boss battle in your map, right, Jake? Uh, yeah, just put a boss battle done. No, please don't do that. Please no. stop. stop. Well, what, what, what else is there? What, I don't understand. No, Jig, you can't just put a boss battle in a map that does nothing. Like, it has to have a purpose. So, like, a lot of mobs. Yeah, okay, so you love mobs, right? But what's the conflict? Why are you taking on this huge, epic being? What are you trying to gain by that? Did they steal your horse, Jig? So Why what you you're saying you is win? conflict does not equal combat. Mm. Mm. Very good. So, so, like, dating could be conflict? Dating is very <laughs> conflictious. <laughs> dating is hard. It is. It's scary. So in, in that example, City of Love, the conflict is you're trying to kind of work through a dialogue tree and not offend the other player, or maybe, maybe you are trying to offend the NPC. Well, it depends on the character <laughs> who you're trying to, you know, approach. Who knows? So do you, do you have other examples of conflict that's not combat? Oh, oh, what's, a, what's a good map that has conflict in it that is not combat? Maybe like a map where somebody's trying to uh, find a job and earn bucks to then build their next city. Where did the mayor go? Who took the mayor? That's, that's the story from Muckluck Lodge. Oh, no, no one knows where the mayor went. 
and they're kind of okay about it, but you find out the mayor and Ski Free Yeti took off to Vegas. I didn't even realize that. The, oh, yeah, because on the sign, it's like, there's no mayor. Yeah. Good. Good conflict. That's a conflict. Everyone was wondering where the mayor went, and that started building up slowly as you met people more and met the different characters. They, they all had a un, un, unifying feature. Well, they had their own personality. The idea was, where's the mayor? I don't care where the mayor is. You know what? I kind of like the mayor. I kind of wish he was back. I don't like the mayor at all. Uh, I'm glad he's gone. Can you use PvP as a conflict mechanism? I think PvP, um, I think any kind of fighting in the game is a game mechanic. And conflict is more about the story, right? So, like, the conflict is these people are invading our lands and it's affecting me and my family, so we need to drive them off. Or I'm a villager living in the village and every night these zombies come and try to break down my door. And I've got my baby little villager, I've got my son, I've got my wife, and I need to protect them from these invading forces. So I'm gonna go out with my sword in hand and fight them off. Right? Sure. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> I like that map, I would play that. Working on it. Make, make that map. <laughs> Uh, incorporate modern map making techniques. Uh, you can see on this slide a little GIF of an NPC that Honorware uh, was working on. Uh, he's, he's a brilliant, uh, very advanced map maker, and I mean, you can just see the sort of technology that goes into making something as complicated as just standing up. That one character is made up uh, of a dozen armor stands all posed and moved around by a generator. And you can just see in that character um, more than just a static dude standing there or a villager with you know, a different name above him. There's, there's a lot more personality to that. And, and personality is, is good. So use, use advanced map tech. Anyone disagree with that one? So I would say, I would actually say don't do this, right? What? Do not. What? Do not set out to incorporate the craziest, highest level advanced technologies in the first map that you make. But look right? how good that is. I know it's so good, but it takes 100 hours to do That's and fine. advanced coding knowledge, right? I got the time. You're, this is definitely something that if you're interested in, you should definitely do, right? Like you should reach out to people in the community and try to understand how to accomplish. But for your first map, do not try to do insane NPCs that are custom modeled and animated out. <laughs> you need to focus on understanding how to put together a project, releasing a story that holds up with other players playing it with some basic mechanics, and then over time, each next map, re uh, reiterate, learn, and use new techniques to tell your story. And that'll be much more effective than getting bogged down by trying to learn the latest techniques that then grind you down to the point of not releasing the map and completely negating what you were setting out to do. You don't have to build this technology yourself, either. You can ask for help. There is lots of places. If you don't know where to go to ask for help, come to me after the panel. I will tell you where to go. But something like, like this. That's not very nice. <laughs> I'll tell you where you can ask for help. Absolutely. And please ask. Everyone yes. in the map making community is really open and supportive of each other. Mm. We don't really fight each other that much. But um, we, uh, we do help each other out as much as possible. And there are groups out there that if you're really serious about this, you can enter and then people are glad to help you. Man, I feel like I'm left out. Like, advanced technology is awesome. Ron, agree with me. You <laughs> use, like, super high-tech stuff in your maps, right? Uh, I try to use more simpler techniques just for the <laughs> art of storytelling, but that's okay. Well, okay. Like, like the first map I released, CDF Air had voice acting in it, but that was something that was so important to me to tell the story that I taught myself how to do that, right? And there's always tutorials online, like just come up with the idea of what feature you want in, and I guarantee you someone will have made a YouTube video on it, like a Absolutely. concept video, 
or there's some forum that has the answer hidden in there, the wiki is great for understanding how to use the commands that run all these maps. Right. And, or just reach out on Twitter. Like, I guarantee you that if you message any of us on Twitter, we'll give you an answer on how to do something. Or we'll find and connect someone to help you do what you're trying to accomplish. To bring it back to the point, if you want to make a game that tells a story, you don't want to get bogged down by the technology, but you can use the technology that is already existing to make it easier to tell your story. And we know where to go for that. So, so I think across all of these points, right, we're not sitting up here telling you how to write the best story for you. But what I find very helpful is when I'm sitting down before I even place a single block, is I kind of write out the outline of what I think my story is, and then I do what I call an iterative process where I will go through the whole story from end to end in my head, and I'll say, okay, is it 20 minutes per arc? You know, where are the gameplay elements versus just pure narration? Where uh, do I have to simplify my story? Where do I have yes. uh, conflict? Where can I add pieces that I know? So you could use these tips as just a guidepost for as you're kind of refining your story and figure out where they're layered in at each, at each iteration. And seek feedback on your story. So to you, wow, this is a great story. Everything makes sense in my head. People are going to love this. This is awful. Uh, what? what? But, but it's all right here. It, it's great. It's, no, it's really bad. I don't understand your story at all. Yeah, who is this character? Uh, OK, OK. You Maybe. didn't introduce this person. OK, so I got a little ahead of myself. Can we work on this to you know, fix the plot holes and really flesh this out? No, I don't know if you can save it. How would you save this? <laughs> We're not playing that game right now. And that's why you get feedback. You, your first story might not be the best, but if you ask someone, hey, what do you think of this? They will tell you what they think about it. And you don't have to do what they tell you, but you can understand how they reacted to your story. And that's the value you get out of asking people for help. The point is with do's. Um, there's a lot of things you should do, and it really does depend on the story that you're wanting to tell. Uh, in City of Love 2, which may or may not be released at any point, uh, <laughs> there, there's a lot, of, a lot of good tech, and with that tech comes time spent doing that tech. Uh, you can see I'm dead in one of those scenes. Uh, CDF is on the uh, talking to Q Magnet on a bench there, and beautiful environments made by Blue Hush. Uh, it's, it's been over a year in development already, and the characters, the, the conversations with some of the characters are really good, but yeah, I gotta make it, I gotta make that thing. <laughs> but, but Jig, you have to release this map, because like, honestly, if you start on something, guys, you should try everything you can to release it. The end goal is to release the map. But my, com oh, my computer is broken. No, no, no. Oh. like. My computer is broken. It's literally broken. Yeah. That makes it difficult. It is OK to put down something that you're not having fun with. You can pick it up later. That's true. Yeah, if, if you, particularly if you, the Minecraft map maker, are not feeling it, it's probably not the right time to work on your map. Put it down for later. Looks like everyone's disagreeing with this. Idiot. That's OK. I, just say, I completely disagree with that. That's OK. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Don't dictate difficulty by story. <laughs> that's awesome. I don't know. That's, that's, that's all I got for that one. Uh, difficulty by story is, is you have, to, in an interactive game, you do yourself a disservice by having a very complicated story because it will not have, be as impactful as something that you can easily communicate to the player in multiple ways. So the difficulty should not come from the story. It should come from the gameplay. Yeah, there, there's kind of two sides to this that I can think of. And as each of these points are coming up, right, I'm thinking about maps I've reviewed. So mm. sometimes I've seen people that want to tell a story where the hero is going to win no matter what. And so they try to make it too easy for the player. And they give them some item that is unbeatable. Uh, but then they feel really powerful, right? You, you may at a moment, but I, it won't be very long until you feel like, okay, this, this you know, is not worth my time. All right. But, okay, so they feel really powerful, but they're like one punch man, right? Hack Which and is flash, an amazing like, anime. You know? What's more interesting is to have their power grow over time. 
Yeah. Oh, progression. You're talking about progression. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You don't, you don't want to make it too hard either. Just because the story says it's a very difficult cave, you don't want to put a thousand mob spawners in there uh, that will instantly kill your players so they can never get through the end of the cave. I think the best example of difficulty by story is um, uh, Hero Brian's Mansion 1 and 2, <laughs> actually. 2 uh, did it really well. You feel very powerful in Hero Brian's Mansion 2, uh, made by Hypixel. And. Mm. When, when you're fighting through those bosses, what a lot of people don't realize, a lot of those are scripted events. Uh, you can only ever do damage to the boss at the very last stage of the event, and they go down very quickly. Um, the whole lead up to that uh, fighting is you don't actually do any damage, but it feels like you feel powerful, and you feel like this is really difficult, and you feel like by the end of that battle that you were super heroic and did so great. Uh, when the story wanted you to feel that, and really, it, you could have stood in the corner and done nothing until the final hit. Don't think about your target audience too hard. <laughs> what? What does that mean? Well, <laughs> think about the story that you want to tell, and tell that story from the perspective of your characters. Uh, this is a prostitute. I uh, didn't think I was going to say that on stage. And when I wrote the dialogue for her, uh, it, I, it was very difficult because, I mean, I'm not one, and I had to try <laughs> to get in the headspace <laughs> of that character. Writing a character like that, you have to make sure that... <laughs> that this, this map is obviously not a G-rated map. And it's characters like that that make it. You, you have that character. That character does what that character does. And because of that, the target audience is something that is determined by that character. Rather than, I'm going to make a G-rated map with a character like this in it, it's not going to work. But if, but if I always want to target YouTubers as my audience, I mean, shouldn't I make sure I cater my map to them? Well, not all YouTubers are G-rated. Yeah, but then I'm, you're going to get like 100 butter sword maps. Well, well, OK, OK. There's a line, guys, right? It's OK to include like profanity or suggestive themes. Just don't cross the line, right? Whoops. The, the, uh, these are maps. Uh, the majority of our audience are kids, right? Younger people and mm. their parents who, if they found out, that there was very inappropriate stuff in these maps would be very annoyed. So we should not do that. Well, the, you know, you can have like disclaimers and stuff. Yeah. What you're saying is we need an ESRB for maps. There's a lot of responsibility that goes into telling a story, and I think you should be responsible, uh, but not let the audience dictate what you're saying. I mean, Jig, you have 10 million downloads across all your maps. Do you think 10 million YouTubers played those maps? No. No, the 10 million people that sat down and experienced what you created, that is, that's why you don't make maps for YouTubers or for your audience. You make maps from your characters and your stories. Because then, other, then you, ex, you share that experience rather than saying, here, I made this for you specifically. Absolutely, and I will just say that City of Love, two, uh, City of Love 1 and 2, they're both clean maps. You, anyone can play them. There's, there's not actually anything really bad that goes on. So no. my target audience, when <laughs> I make a map, I don't look at demographics and think, OK, you know, males between the age of 15 and 21 is going to love this map. No. What I strive to do is to tell a good story that a storyteller or a reader or a movie fan or anyone who loves a good story will go through the map and really enjoy themselves, right? They'll get immersed in the experience, lose themselves in the fact that this isn't a Minecraft map anymore. This is me in this world walking through it and experiencing a story. So that's my target audience, people who really get into it. The flow. Yeah. It sounds like target audience could be something that you use when you promote your map after you're done making it, but let the story drive it while you're making it. I love that. Yeah. Don't out of character talk to the player. Okay, so. Can you rescue the princess? Can I rescue the princess? You have to rescue the princess. 
This is something that I personally put in here as a pet peeve is when I'm playing maps, I can't tell you how many times somebody will be telling me a story through signs just as the easiest example. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, a different voice is talking, like maybe the map maker is talking to the player instead of the character. Or now suddenly uh, the player's thoughts are on these signs. And it can get very confusing who's telling the story. Uh, you've also heard of something called the fourth wall. If you're in the middle of a map and suddenly the map maker steps in to break the fourth wall and all immersion is completely mm. gone. So think about that as well when you're kind of detailing out your dialogue or your narration in particular. It's not good to write in a map. You walk into a forest, you are scared because they're, they're probably not. Now, what's, what would be interesting, though, is maybe you load up into a survival world and someone starts talking to you. Like, what about like a voice in your head situation? I mean, that, that could be work. It could work if that's kind of the concept of your Yeah, story. the premise. But then if you're going to add that voice, be careful what other voices you add that might confuse uh, the player. Or other sounds interrupting other panels. <laughs> I find it very hard if uh, the entire story was told through characters and then right at the end, oh, by the way, fight this boss. Yeah. That, that doesn't drive the story forward. But if all the other characters start telling me about the boss early on, I hear about him. He's suddenly way bigger in my mind when I get to the end. And that's why you don't say, go find the princess, go find the princess, go find the princess. You're never going to get to the castle. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, don't release your map without playtesting it. Yes. Never. And just to be specific, this is not about playtesting uh, the, the mechanics of the map. I mean, absolutely you need to do that, but especially with the story, and we sort of touched on this one before, um, you need to make sure it makes sense, and you need to make sure you fix your spelling mistakes on your signs, uh, like, you know, that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, clap for that, please. Clap please, more for please that. Please spell check Make your some work. Noise for that. Please spell check your work. <laughs> yes. There are too many maps. Without. What does playtesting mean? And it, I wanted to find that a bit more. Uh, go ahead. So, have other people play your maps and ideally um, have them recorded or let you, or have them let you sit in on that to the point where you don't talk, you, you be quiet, and you watch everything that they do. Yes. So if they're having problems getting through a puzzle that is blatantly obvious to you, that's not them, that is you. But what yes. if you don't have any friends? Hi, if, come ask for help. Yeah, yeah. If you, if you, map-making community. Yeah, I was going to say, if you put out there at Twitter, the forums, et cetera, you're making a map, you want someone to play test it, people will sign up. There's a lot of people out there who want to be the first to see your maps. Where, where can you do this? Well, talk to Moshe after the show. <laughs> talk to me after the. <laughs> He'll tell the you. The point is uh, the the point that I want to add to that is respect your playtesters by providing them enough content to play. If you spend one day making a map that people will only play for one minute. You could ask them to play test it, but set up the expectation, hey, I have a one minute map. Uh, can you just test this for me? I'm, I'm looking to see how y people will react to it. And They'll probably that's say how it's you short. respect your play testers. Sorry? They'll probably say it's short. Sure. Hopefully there's more feedback than that. Absolutely. So well, one thing I like to do as well is if, if I have the luxury of having someone play my map and record it, I will sometimes play the recording and not watch the screen, like have my eyes closed or just not watch the recording, but listen to the player and hearing what they react to as opposed to, you know, getting distracted by what's on the screen. This is another tool you can put in your tool. There's a lot of techniques to... Uh... <laughs> I just got that. Uh, there's a lot of techniques uh, in receiving feedback and interpreting feedback. Uh, I don't know if we should get into all the details about it, but there's a lot of theories, and there's no right or wrong way, but the better way is to not interact with the player who is playing your map as much as possible. Let them experience it. 
Uh, oh, wow. Well, that, what happened there? Don't tell your story. Let the player experience it. Mm. Hey, I did it. I made a prediction. Yeah. Have you guys ever played a map where the first thing you're, you're, that happens is you're handed a book in the game, and it's like a 50-page book <laughs> with the background of the world, and your character's just... I like to read. Yeah, <laughs> but you're just staring at a static screen, right? Remember, this is a first-person experience. Mm. So the more the player can drive the story and see things happen and maybe get some dialogue, you know, passing by them as opposed to stopping to listen to you. But you don't have to read the book. You just, like, skip through a couple pages and close it and ignore everything it said, right? And that's the worst thing that could ever happen as a storyteller, right? Like, you, the player just said that your story isn't important. I'm just going to go through this map. Right, and they yeah. miss the whole point. And then they're confused later on because, oh, I don't know what happened. So, perfect I, example, right? I mean, well, people should read the books. They should. Shouldn't, shouldn't they just read, if you put the content in and they want to experience, shouldn't they just read the book so they no. can have the best experience? There's a big difference between should and do, right? So people should read the books, but players don't. They but just not don't. Not necessarily that, I mean, you have to think about what you're putting in those books. If they should, at the very least, if you're going to put a novel, be optional or released as a supplementary downloadable PDF that you can buy on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it's a context thing, right? So to have world events happen in a book, it doesn't make much sense to me. But to have like uh, Jigger Bob's private diary in the book on the bookshelf behind his bed with all his scandalous secrets, that makes sense. And that sounds it's interesting. It's going to be sizzling. Oh, yeah. So the difference between don't tell your story and let the player experience it, there's a big difference in saying the town was attacked, and then you're walking through the town, and then boom, over there, TNT goes off. You hear the cries of the attackers oh, run what in. Is happening? Oh and my you're God. like, what is going on? Oh, the rest geez. of the people in the village are oh. running around screaming oh. their heads off. Oh. Things are on fire. Where's my laptop? You know? <laughs> <laughs> but like, the player is there in that experience now, right? Like, they are in the story. They are experience mm. it, experiencing yes. it instead of just like, oh, the town was attacked. Oh, that's nice. Press button to attack town. <laughs> yeah, I think a, a really simple example, too, is if you have a written book, let's say it's somebody's diary, you can choose that the first page says, as this player rushed out of the room, they dropped their diary, right? Or you can actually have an NPC leave the room and then spawn the diary there so the player experiences that instead of reading about it. Absolutely. Yeah, actually seeing it. But that, that would require some technology. That's yeah. Fine. Is that all right? I, yes. <laughs> okay, Absolutely good. do that because it helps you tell your story. It, you do, if you say there's a book behind the bed and it's a secret rather than player discovering it, why don't you just write a book instead? That maybe is that the bet is, or do you want to make a game or do you want to make a story? And what we're, t what we're, what you're really saying is the story is the game. The game is the story. They are not separate in any way, shape, or form. It's all about using your mediums. Uh, don't assume anything. <laughs> <laughs> so the, this is an, an annoying uh, donkey right in front of the text. So th this one, uh, I can give some good examples where you will be playing a map, uh, and in in the map maker's mind, they have a story or a background. So, for example, I played a really awesome map. It was based on Back to the Future by CSA BUSA. Uh, but unless you actually watch the movie, it's really hard to understand what's happening because they just tell you to go from place to place, but they don't give you the story. Contrary wise for myself, when I created the Wonderland map a long time ago, I thought that Everyone who plays Minecraft knows what Alice in Wonderland is and what the story is. Mm. And the first, like, five LPs I watched on YouTube, they're like, I'm not familiar with Alice in Wonderland, but I'm going <laughs> to play this map. And I'm just like, whoa, that's really bad. I totally assumed that everyone had that context. You have to... You have to assume that people know nothing about the game, about your story, and then you have to put that all in the map in an easy to understand and easy to pick up way. So like even if it was some obscure crafting recipe that any pro Minecrafter would know, right? 
if you're not a pro Minecrafter and you're playing this for the first time or you're coming from console edition and where they don't have this item, you know, you need to put it in the map um, in a nice subtle way that, you know, works so that it doesn't break your whole experience. Like giving, uh, giving a player all of the ingredients for a powered minecart track and expecting them to know what it is without having ever built one before. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, that's a super comprehensive list of things uh, that we all agree on. Absolutely. 100%. Uh, storytelling is a very dynamic sort of experience, and if you have any questions, put you your hand 15. up. Uh, Mosh is going to come down onto the floor and come to you, and you can ask any questions that you may have. There's You've one on the left, minutes. there's one on the right, there's a whole bunch. All right, we have a question over here. Hello, you mentioned release. Uh, gentlemen, Hello. you mentioned Greetings. release these maps. And uh, where do you release these maps? That is, where do you publish them? And how I might, how might I go about um, finding one to play, having never done so? I think the best place where you can get them is www.jiggerbov.net. <laughs> Uh, um, I would not uh, <laughs> actually check him out, but um, the best place for an independent map maker to release their maps without a huge following or a big channel is minecraftmaps.com, I would say, um, as well as the forums um, and Twitter and all those places. Yeah, I, I think minecraftmaps.com is a great place. They do have a curation system, so they don't put every map out there that they receive. Um, but you can either host it on your own website, like some people do, or you can just put it on Mediafire and then put the links to it on places like Planet Minecraft or the forums. Uh, and that's where people, those, those probably three places are the top places people go. Sorry. We have another question over here, but we have a wonderful costume. Can we get a little spin on that? Nice. Oh, very oh, nice. Amazing. Give it up for her. That's a great costume. All right. Please ask, what is your question? Um, you've been mostly talking about like how you come up with stories, um, but do you build the actual builds yourself? Uh, so I'll take that one. Um, so it depends, right? You can reach out for help from your friends. You can build them yourself using some of the tools available, like MC Edit or Voxel Sniper. Uh, you can do it by hand and creative, um, or you can get a build team to do it uh, if you know people. Um, there's all kinds of ways to get the physical environment. Yeah, I, tip, myself, I typically build everything by hand because I kind of know exactly how I want it to look. Um, but I have done a couple recent collaborations where I told folks on my realm to just Kiss it. go in this plot area and build me a city. And it was a lot of fun to watch them play off of each other with different ideas and add, you know, simple things like storefront names became very much more personalized uh, when I had a build team doing it. Yeah, I think there's a, a bunch of different ways you can do that, um, either by getting friends or just building it yourself um, and, and asking your friends or even post on, uh, you know, Minecraft forums or whatever and say, hey, can, is there, I want, I want to build this thing, this is my vision, uh, can you help me with that? Uh, we have another question over here. Here we go. Um, so uh, what kind of mods and plugins do you what? use to um, tell a story with NPCs? Like, you know, the oh. voice acting stuff and, you know, the armor stands and stop motion stuff that you saw. Like the gif of the guy standing up. Uh, what kind of plugins and mods do you use? So the best part uh, is... These days, you don't need to use any mods uh, or plugins to make stuff like that. All of everything that you've seen so far is all vanilla using command blocks. Uh, people like uh, Redstone Scientist, and we're going to see something of his a uh, little in a minute, um, has a lot of generators. So he actually has a cinematic uh, creator where you put in some signs, uh, run some commands, and plug the coordinates into his website. And it creates a whole uh, it creates a whole thing for you, and it's all in game. Uh, like resource this. resource packs. Yeah, be careful. I can hear everything you're saying, by the way, Mosh. Really? <laughs> yeah, the mic is really good. <laughs> anyway, um, so 
resource packs have the ability to do custom models now as well. Um, and there are many tutorials that you can find online that help you with uh, all of that stuff. And it's all vanilla. You don't need mods or plugins. Uh, and I find if you use mods or, mods or plugins, that it really limits uh, the audience, because then there's another hoop that they have to jump through to play these maps. We have a question from Jonathan. Since I've tried to making maps before, I noticed you have to use a lot of commands, and you also have to make the good story. What would you say you have is harder, and what you have to do more, the story or the commands? Uh, I mean, I would say the commands. So, for me personally, I like making maps without a lot of command blocks, just to see what I can get across in the story. I have a series. Uh, we're on the third series of vanilla challenge maps, where in fact you have to make the map entirely in survival mode, not even in creative mode. So to me, I, I think coming up with the story is a lot easier than figuring out all these crazy commands and how they work. It really depends on the complexity of the story and how much automation you can use to create the back end behind it. Got another question? Yeah, we have a question from James. Hey, James. So uh, how much code does go into like all of this individually, every single part? How, mu how much code? Yeah. Like how many hours of code do you have to put into every single part of your story? So that completely depends on the scope of your map. So if you're trying to tell a very long map with lots of interactive elements, lots of story points, um, lots of trigger points for things to happen that'll take a long time coding it all. Um, we, you try to develop a system that works for you that you can kind of copy and paste and then edit some. Um, but maps that are smaller and then that aren't as uh, technologically advanced don't take as much code at all. Um, the, um, the average lines of code in a map really depends. I mean... And it depends on the method that you're telling the story to. Um, I've <laughs> A very short map called Map Maker Christmas Party. Uh, it's it's a disaster. Don't play it. Um, it there's no that there's no code at all. Uh, it just signs on blocks with player heads, and that took you know a day to build. Yeah, there, there's a group in the audience. In fact, they're all spread out. But Jasper, Kavolta, Rackabilly's over there. These there's a whole bunch of people that have made maps in 60 minutes or less. So. It all depends on what the scope, as CDF said, of your map. But anywhere from 60 minutes to you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours. Which I would suggest trying that. So the idea behind a 60-minute map is you have 60 minutes to completely come up with an idea, tell a story, and build it, and make it work, right? Now, that's very challenging. But what it's teaching you to do is to think on the fly, you know, come up with a story, a short story, use the world around you to uh, put the story in, and then play test it in a very quick time. And it's not about making the best map in the world. It's about making something that hopefully works um, and that you can keep honing your skills in uh, doing that. And learning from it. And we, have a, we have a question over here from Taylor. Hey, Taylor. Um, where would you start your work, um, the worlds for the maps? Like, would you start it in your single player world on the Minecraft? I usually start it in just a creative flat world. So uh, I personally like to cr start in single player mode, and I like to fly around and look at the terrain and then just find like kind of the perfect picturesque spot to put my story in. Yeah, it really depends on how you're going about building the map. If you're going to use some of these special um, generators like World Edit or World Painter, World Painter is really great for sculpting a large environment very quickly. Um, you, then you would create the maps in there. If you're looking to stick a map in a vanilla generation, just start up a creative world with a vanilla generation on, or you can do a flat world, build the environment around that, and then go from there. And the other thing to consider, sorry, one more, um, is that you don't even need to start your story or map at all on a world at all. Uh, you can have a document like Ron does, um, hundreds of Excel spreadsheets, and Word files that outline every facet of the map before you even begin. Uh, so even before you open Minecraft, you can have all the details done. So when you open it, you can get started right away.
We have time for two more questions. So we're going to take one here from Matthew, and then we're going to take one more after this. When are we going to get to read Jigger Bob's diary? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you don't want to. Let me just say that. Play City of Love 2. Or don't. <laughs> I think we can get one more question in after this next one. We have a question from Risto here in the middle, and this is our last question. Hello, uh, how would you go about incorporating these do's and those in a server setting? Server settings uh, change everything. Well, storytelling in servers is very hard because the story is no longer a single player or multiplayer experience at one point in time in your story. It's now an instance, like, there's 100,000 people on your server. That's what you have to design for, right? And so everyone's at a different point in the story. If you're telling a strong single storytelling narrative, right? A strong narrative. Now on a server, I would suggest doing more overarching narratives or, or overarching stories. So like you'll see like, oh, the three factions are fighting, but there won't be defined fights. Like the fights will happen on their own through the players, like give context, but it's very hard to tell like a single player perspective experience on a server without instancing it, which is creating its own copy for those players in that party. Um, which is not to say that it can't be done. Um, having, having isolated quests, you can still, within the scope of the quest, uh, adhere to these do's and don'ts as well. And as we've already explained, uh, these do's and don'ts are more like a guideline than strict rules. Last question. Last question, encore question. Everyone give it up <laughs> for these guys, and we're going to ask this last question. Oh, thank you guys for coming. Thank you. This is from Ryan. Um, I was wondering, how do you do the custom resource packs and put it into the server PDF file or whatever you use, and how do you upload it so you can have it for shared to other friends? Okay, so I would start um, with a basic, the normal resource pack, right? And in that resource pack, there are a bunch of PNG files, which are the textures for all the blocks in the game. And it's also got some sounds in there that you can insert custom sounds or dialogue into it. Um, you start changing that resource pack, you zip it up, and then you host it on like a file hosting service, like Mediafire or Dropbox. And if you want to put it on your server, you set it up in a way that the server pulls from your file hosting location, and that every time a player joins the server, they download that resource pack, and then it's automatically applied. Now, there are a lot of different YouTube uh, videos on this that go into the very fine details on how to do this. Tons of tutorials. Tons of tutorials. Tons. And um, there's always someone out there who can help you with that. Um, if it's a single player experience, you create the resource pack, you zip it up, you call it resources.zip, and you throw it in the single player world, and it will automatically work for the player who logs in. So yeah. That was um, some amazing questions from the audience. Sorry we couldn't get to everyone, but if you ask us afterwards, it would be great. I have a question for you guys. Who wants to make a map now? Who oh, wants to make a map guys. with friends? <laughs> Stand up if you want to make a map with your friends. <laughs> All right, all right, yes. all right, all right. Look at I all have these some people. codes you... for realms. You tell me what your map idea is after the panel. I will give you a 30-day free trial on realms to make your map with your friends. So before okay. that, uh, we have one more uh, interesting thing. Uh, there's a map called Wesley that the Redstone Scientist and Dragon014 are working on. Uh, it really has a lot of the cool tech that I'm interested in, but it also shows a m much more artistic side to what you can do in Minecraft as far as storytelling and narrative goes. Uh, so we're going to take a quick look at that. And uh, I do want to thank you, everybody, for coming as well. Thank you thank so you much, Thank you guys. so much. <laughs> One hen, two ducks, three squawking geese, four limerick oysters, five corpulent porpoises, six pairs of Don Lavore's tweezers, 7,000 Macedonians in full Maybe battle array. for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken, and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss, 
If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone, and so hold on when there's nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings, nor lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And, which is more, you'll be a man, my son. So that map is gonna be awesome. Thank you so much, guys. We'll be down here to answer any further questions and sign stuff. For as long as we can before they kick us out. And there, there is one more map making panel in an hour uh, up in 304, I think. Yeah, 304. And we're all going to be there as well. So we don't have long to hang out here. <laughs> sure. Oh, what's your name?